Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Louis DeLuna from Aldec, who's going to talk today about DO254, the standard for the aerospace industry, which will provide some insights into what's coming with the ISO 26262 in the automotive space. Louis, what is DO254? DO254 is the uh, Development Assurance Guidance for PLDs such as uh, FPGAs, A6 and CPLDs. So the FAA here in the U.S. and EASA in Europe, they recommend to uh, adhere to the process defined in that DO254 specification. And while similar to ISO 26262, it's not a, you have to do this, nobody's ever going to buy your parts if they don't conform to this, right? Yeah, they're actually very careful in, uh, in being prescriptive. So DO254, they use a, what they call a uh, objective based approach rather than a prescriptive uh, based approach. So that means they don't tell you uh, how to do it, they tell you the objectives that you need to satisfy in order to comply to DO254. How long has DO254 been around? Uh, so that uh, RTCA DO254 book or that document specification, uh, that was written by uh, RTCA back in 2000. And the FAA started to recommend that in 2005 via this, uh, what's called the uh, FAA Advisory Circular uh, 20-152. So when that AC came out in 2005, that's when it actually started that uh, anybody, any supplier uh, developing these type of systems, they have to adhere to DO254. And the goal of this was to uh, guarantee safety in all the designs that were being done? Yeah, that's that's the uh, that's a major that's the main goal of this DO254 is because devices such as these FPGAs and ASICs they have become so complex that it's very difficult to to determine the impact to safety. So what they did is they uh, they established these processes, so list of processes uh, that that you have to follow uh, when you develop these type of devices, and when you follow or adhere to these type of processes, then your uh, chance to comply to the up to 54 uh, increases. Why don't you draw this out for us? So what are we looking at here? So this is the uh, entire uh, hardware design life cycle for the up to 54. What's good about this is it really aligns well with the uh, FPGA and ASIC development flow. So as you can see, uh, as usual, you start with planning. So that's where you define uh, your plan, your strategy for compliance, and that's something that you need to work with the, uh, with the FAA or EASA. So there's a lot of documents involved uh, in, into, uh, into the planning phase. For example, the main one, it's called the uh, PHAC or Plan for Hardware Aspects of Certification. So after planning, you go towards to the uh, hardware design process, which is act actually includes uh, five different uh, uh, sub-processes here. The first one is requirements capture. That's where you define the requirements. The requirements are very important in this uh, DO254 because DO254 as a whole is a requirements-based approach. Uh, the design is based on requirements and the verification and validation is also based on requirements. That means all of the activities really flow down from the requirements. So you, you start from the requirements capture and then uh, based on the requirements you conceptualize the design, you conceptualize the top level uh, hierarchy architecture of your design uh, and then, uh, when you finish with the conceptual design, of course, you, uh, you, you proceed to the detailed design, which entails uh, development of the HDL code, okay? And then, this, so this is the HDL uh, design phase, and this is the implementation sub-process, which is synthesis and place and route. So making sure that your synthesis and place and route tool do not over-optimize or do not insert any unintended features into the design. Okay. And this is the, uh, the final sub-process here in the hardware design process, is the uh, product transition, which is basically establishes the baseline so that you can uh, uh, replicate the PLD into, into, uh, into the uh, later uh, life cycle of the project. How much time and money does this add to the whole process when you have to conform to these rules? Yeah, so that's, uh, that's a very interesting question. So the entire project for a PLD, uh, yeah, it really takes an average, depending on the design assurance level, uh, it could take anywhere from two to five years. 
And in the semiconductor space, we're typically used to sometimes three months to six month design cycles and then finally getting it into manufacturing. This brings it out a lot further than what we're dealing with right now. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's a good observation. Uh, so there's a couple of, of course, as we know, a couple of uh, international airframe or Boeing and Airbus. So these are the two main ones. And there's uh, other uh, helicopter manufacturers out there. So the ratio between the automotive uh, suppliers, the automotive manufacturers, and the airframer are, are, are actually very, very different. So the, uh, the, the goal is still safety. So uh, the avionics industry is uh, very slow to adopt the new technologies. So actually, uh, you know, I've heard from many uh, certification authority that even though that device is, has been used into so many uh, different systems out there and has the nicest features out there, but it doesn't mean that uh, it could be installed in, in the aircraft. So it needs to be before you install a technology in an aircraft, that means it really needs to go through a stringent process. So how much more additional validation, verification, supporting processes need to go into this that you didn't have in a standard design for say a, a smartphone? Yeah, so these are the uh, supporting processes for DO254. So you have the uh, validation and verification, which is basically ensuring that um, your uh, detailed design, your final product meets the uh, uh, requirements that you define. So what that means is you have to formulate your verification plan and your test cases based on the requirements. And then based on your uh, test cases, you, you uh, develop your test bench. So the most difficult part is the, uh, the fact that the validation and verification needs to be a requirements-based approach. So all of the activities that, uh, that you do in the uh, validation and verification, or VNV as they call it, uh, needs to be requirements-based. And the goal here is that in a safety-critical market, these things have to last for, what, 10, 20 years? Yeah, 10, 20 years or more, yes. So by the time you get all this done, how much time does this typically take to bring a, a chip to market we're talking two to five years but it's even beyond that right because now you have to integrate it into the whole system yeah so that's actually outside deal 254 so the deal 254 is just making sure that uh, your chip uh, the design that goes in there uh, uh, adheres to the processes defined in deal 254 and then the whole system has to be verified and validated with this chip inside, right? Yeah, so that's uh, another uh, difficult aspect of DO254 is uh, the PLD within the circuit card, you need to verify that within the circuit card, okay? And then the circuit card, of course, you need to verify that, validate that within the uh, context of the system. So typically this is a multi-million dollar purchase the, co the cost of a chip and the extra verification is going to get absorbed and, and distributed across that whole product, which is essentially the, the system, which is an airplane. How do you do that for a $30,000 car or even a $20,000 car? Yeah, that's, I think that's uh, going to be one of the uh, big challenges in the automotive is to figure that out. You know, another side of this is the tools qualification. What happens there on uh, DO254 versus, say, um, a smartphone? So, yeah, so the tool qualification, uh, the FAA and the ASA basically, uh, bottom line is they don't trust the uh, design verification tools that, that uh, suppliers use. So as, as a supplier, uh, it, it's the supplier's responsibility to make sure that the design tools and the verification tools they use uh, are qualified within the uh, process that the DO254 uh, described in the document. So the, uh, so the uh, certification authority, they pay attention only to the design and verification tools. The design um, may not insert any potential defect into the design and the verification tool uh, may not uh, fail to detect any, uh, any uh, error into, uh, into the design. So those, those are the two main things. So, uh, as a uh, EDA vendor, so our, our responsibility is then to help uh, or assist the uh, the applicants uh, for the tool qualification uh, process. So uh, as a as a vendor, it's our uh, it's also we have made it uh, our responsibility to supply those documents that they can use for tool qualification. 
From your side, as as a vendor of these qualified tools, what has to change in terms of the, the tool itself? Is it more just being able to prove it, or is it actually change the, the structure of the uh, tool itself? So one distinction between the ISO and uh, ISO 26262 and, and DO254 is um, in DO254, there is no such certificate that when you uh, qualify the tool, that it's qualified for all of the different programs that, uh, that you can carry on in the future. So the, uh, the tool qualification is done at the program level. So if it's, uh, if it's qualified that program, you have to uh, perform another tool qualification or assessment for the next program. So there's no such thing as a uh, uh, certificate that, uh, for example, the, uh, that you can uh, obtain from ISO 26262. What happens to the IP that, that goes into these systems, third-party IP? That has to be certified by DO254 as well, right? And what sort of challenges does that bring? Yeah, so the, there are a couple of uh, two main challenges in reusing IPs. Uh, and it's mainly due to the fact that most of these IPs are encrypted. And uh, also, uh, they're called the hard IPs, meaning they are built into the, uh, to the chip. Um, in, in DO254, for DAL A and B, uh, design assurance levels, you have to make sure that um, you check your, your HDL code against HDL coding standards. Okay, so if, you, if you're reusing an IP uh, from a third party and you don't have access to the HDL code, then you have no way to run that against HDL coding standards. And also you, also, you, you need to establish traceability from the requirements to the HDL code. So if you have only access to the net list, it's, it's, it's difficult to do or it's, it's impossible to do. One of the terms that comes up in uh, DO254 is the design assurance level. What is that and how do we meet that? Yeah, so uh, they, they establish uh, what they call a uh, design assurance level or DAL. Um, so that flows down from the system to the PLD. Uh, it depends on the function of the PLD, of course, and the system. So the highest uh, criticality is uh, what they call design assurance level A. Uh, a failure of that uh, PLD would mean uh, fatalities of all occupants in the plane, including all of the passengers and the crew. Um, the next one is design assurance level B. Uh, a failure of that uh, uh, device would mean uh, fatalities of a limited number of, of the occupants in the plane. Uh, level C is a potential injuries only and level D is potential discomfort and the lowest one is a level E which is uh, no effect. And these are similar to what we're seeing in automotive with the ASOL A, B, C, and D, right? Yes, correct. Louis DeLuna, thanks for a great explanation of DO254. Pleasure to be here. Thank